Constitution and our founders gave us another option. They said we should be friends with all who want to be friends, trade with all who would like to trade with us, and, and uh, be in a negotiating form and never be uh, aggressors. But uh, today, I thought there were those only two choices, and I offered the third. But unfortunately, we've ended up with a fourth one, which dramatizes how foolhardy our foreign policy is. And it has to do with Pakistan. Pakistan, you know, we are dropping a lot of uh, drones, uh, using a lot of drones and bomb, dropping, dropping bombs, and killed literally thousands of people. Uh, no, nobody knows the exact number, but literally a lot of people have been killed there. And there, there's collateral damage, but we don't count those, those individuals as people. But at the same time, we're dropping and antagonizing the people, and the people resent it and really despise us doing this, we're giving billions of dollars to the government of Pakistan. And there's a civil strife building there, and uh, that, lo and behold, now there's even talk about what else that we must do. Will we have to send our troops in there? And then we had a comment just the other day by the uh, propped up leader that we have in Afghanistan, somebody that has been associated with uh, his family, associated with drugs and corruption. Uh, the president is called uh, by the name of Karzai. So Karzai said, uh, well, in gratitude for what you have done for me, in case you go to war with Pakistan, we're gonna, Pakistan, we're gonna side with Pakistan. So this, this whole thing of uh, supporting individuals, we were on the side of bin Laden, we had been on the side of uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, whose side are we on in Saudi Arabia? Oh, yeah, we're good friends with Saudi Arabia. But guess what? 15 out of the 19 individuals that came here on 9-11 came from Saudi Arabia. And also, they have a dictatorship. They follow Sharia law. They're not Democrats, and yet we're their best friends, so to speak. I think the founders had it right. Be neutral. Mind our own business. Come home and be willing to tra trade and talk to people. You know, Ronald Reagan had one of the most fantastic statements when he wrote his memoirs. Because in the early 80s, uh, I was in Congress and then back out and then went back in again. But in the early 80s, I was there when uh, Reagan sent the troops, uh, sent the Marines into Lebanon. And I can remember speaking out against this and uh, worrying about what might happen. And when he sent, him, uh, sent the troops in, uh, he was challenged about, well, are you going to really stay there and be determined? Are you ever going to leave? He says, I will never leave with my tail between my legs. But the Marines got killed and the troops came out. Suicide terrorism stopped. As soon as the French and Israel and the United States left, there was no more suicide terrorism uh, in, the, in that region. So when Reagan wrote his memoirs on this, he, uh, he talked about the Marines, and I thought it was very significant. So he said, he said that, uh, I know what I said. I said I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't leave with my tail between my legs. He says, but the reason I did that, he says, I had not realized how irrational the politics of that region was. So he was admitting the truth. And he went on to say that he said if he had had a policy of neutrality and had followed that at that time, he says those Marines would still be alive today. Now that is an astounding statement because it is so true, said by a person who made a mistake, admitted the mistake. Something similar to this happened with Mac McNamara when before he died he wrote some memoirs. And they weren't exactly apologetic, but there was a lot of admission there that the Vietnam was a total disaster. What a tragedy. 60,000 Americans killed, and, uh, and he was really the orchestrator of that war. So when he was being interviewed um, with, about the book, somebody, one of the interviewers said, do you want to apologize uh, for what you, you had done? And uh, he says, what good would an apology be? He said, what, the only thing that is of any value is you recognize the mistakes and you change your policy, change your way. So what I would like to see happen, and I think it is happening because the country's coming our way and 65% of the people want to come out of Afghanistan. 
we have to admit the truth. We can't keep lying to ourselves. If we, if we have a policy that is deeply flawed, we have to come clean and change it, whether it's monetary policy or foreign policy or Federal Reserve policy or spending policy. We have to admit the truth that we went the wrong direction and we can change it. One thing about uh, the Vietnam War, because I was in the service, I never went to Vietnam, but the saying was uh, when Kennedy was in office and, uh, and uh, then Johnson expanded the war, the, the comment was always, we have to stop it or there would be a domino effect. It would just go all communists throughout the region. And uh, that was why we were supposed to be there. So what, what happened, we literally lost, we have to admit that. We lost and we left and it was, it was a tragedy. Loss of life and many dollars ushered in the inflation of the uh, 1970s. But what did it usher in an age where the communists took over? Did the uh, communists in China become more communistic or did they move in the direction of becoming westernized where now there are bankers? What happened in Vietnam? They became more westernized when there was no use of force, no war, no, no ar invasion of armies. All of a sudden, they looked and they decided that we go in a different direction. Now we trade with them, we travel back and forth with them. Uh, their president comes here and visits. So there's pretty darn strong evidence that you can gain a lot more in peace than in war and accomplish it. One of the reasons I'm excited about the whole freedom movement is that my personal beliefs are very much uh, in coincidence with our Constitution, the protection of, of liberty. But I have a personal reason uh, why I want to live in a free society. Uh, I, I believe I could s s say that even if I were poorer and we would all be poorer, I would still want to live in a free society. But. Fortunately for us, we don't have to make that decision because the freer a society, the more wealth is and the better distribution. There's not an equality of wealth. Equality, when you strive for equality of wealth, you can get it and the wealth is very low. But if you strive for freedom, you will have the maximum wealth and uh, the best uh, distribution. So, but my personal belief is that uh, our, our goals have to be more than just, uh, you know, our wealth. But uh, I, I think freedom offers us an opportunity to be more creative, and uh, it, off, it offers us a chance to exert our responsibility to strive for excellence and virtue in our personal lives. Now, governments right now make this attempt. They want us to be virtuous, and they want everything to be fair and equal. But every time the government does that, they have to do it at the expense of liberty. So therefore, the free society is the only one that can come up with a prosperous society and one that offers us the maximum opportunity to, to maximize our own abilities. And uh, I'm concerned because uh, uh, though there's lots of reason to be optimistic about our movement and our gaining of, uh, of attention. But also, when you see what's happening on the streets around the world and in this country as well, I think it's all healthy when they're talking about there are problems out there and the government has messed up and we need to look at the Federal Reserve, we need to look at these wars. This is all very healthy. But then there's another element that would like to com that, that would like to take on the opportunity and say no. It's because there's a profit system and people make profits. We have to distinguish the difference between people making honest profits versus those who are ripping us off and using the government to make profits and getting their bailouts. There's a big difference. But the opportunity presents ourselves our, to ourselves now, and uh, something will come of it. There will not be the maintaining of the status quo. The last 40 years of the status quo of spending more and printing more in that whole process, that has ended. I don't think for a minute that is, hasn't ended. A lot of people haven't awakened to this. They're getting more concerned. But the big question is what are we going to replace it with? We don't have to invent it. This country knew something about it. We once understood what property rights were, contracts rights, individual liberty, and sound money, a sensible foreign policy. So we don't have to come along and invent something brand new. 
All we need to do is send people to Washington who understand and are determined to follow the rule of law and respect our Constitution. Yeah. And there's every reason to be optimistic that uh, if we do our job well, uh, we can win this bat battle. You know, Sam Johnson said that uh, uh, it, it isn't a numbers game. A lot of people worry, well, 51% aren't with us. John, uh, Samuel Adams said, he said, you know what we need? He says, we need an irate, tireless minority willing to stand up and spread the brush fires of freedom in the minds and the hearts of the American people and the people. And I believe that is what is happening. Our time has arrived. We must win this because if we do not, and if we succumb to more government, that means less liberty and not the kind of world we want to live in. Let's be optimistic and fight for our freedoms and the Constitution. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Congressman Ron Paul.